Today's event is an opportunity to meet the client advisors for LexisNexis Interaction and hear their thoughts on some common themes and issues around marketing, business development, and CRM. My name is Matt Thompson and I'll be your moderator today. I've been part of the Interaction team for almost 18 years in a variety of roles and I'm currently leading our new client success team program that we started earlier this year. As part of this program, each of our clients uh, have been assigned both an account manager as well as a client advisor. The client advisor role was created because we wanted to help our clients not only optimize the ROI that they receive from Interaction, but also to help them build world-class marketing and business development programs. I'm personally very excited for the program and really thrilled with the team that we've put together to better serve our clients. But today you'll get a chance to meet these expert client advisors, who include someone with extensive Interaction consulting experience, a digital marketing leader from a major law firm, and a seasoned veteran in the professional services software industry. The format for today's webinar is a presentation from each of the three client advisors, followed by questions and answers. Attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them via the questions pane on your webinar control panel. During the last few minutes of the webinar, the client advisors will be available to answer those questions that have been submitted. Please note that we are recording today's event and you will receive an email within a week with a link to the recording that you can share with your colleagues. At this time, I'll turn the webinar over to our first presenter, Brian Austin. Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Austin, and as Matt mentioned, I'm a client advisor for Interaction. I've spent the past 15 years in marketing and business development technology, helping firms strategize, design, and implement enterprise-wide systems to support the firm and marketing business development goals. Over the course of many of these projects, I've learned many lessons, and as a client advisor, I'm excited to continue to ensure firms maximize their marketing technology assets. So 15 years ago, I moved to Chicago to, to enter this professional space. But to be honest with you, uh, moving to a city where they have two professional baseball teams, Cubs and Sox, for a guy who's loyal to the St. Louis Cardinals is a, is a tough road. I've however found that running on the Chicago lakefront helps with this stress. But in all honesty, as the slide suggests, I'm truly just a jogger aspiring to become that runner. So enough about me and some of my background. Um, I wanted to get focused back on helping clients align technology with strategy. During the next few minutes, I wanted to review some client team program strategies that I've seen over the past decade. My hope is that, you are, that as you are embarking down the client team path for the first or nth time, you may pick up some tidbits that will help. So first of all, client team programs. This isn't something new. This is something that we've all been talking about for many, many years. Um, and a lot of folks are trying to do that. So our data, our interviews with our own clients, suggest around 80% of clients have some form of a key client program. But only 39% of those that we've interviewed are actually coming back and saying that these programs have been successful for them. So we've spent time over the past several years <clears throat> talking with them about why have they not been successful? What do they need to be successful? And for the ones that are successful, how are they doing that? What, what are the differentiating approaches here? And so over the course of the next few minutes, we'll, uh, we'll talk about these. So the client team programs can support many key client objectives. So what has helped some firms is an approach that client team programs can support various key objectives. Obviously, these we want to tie back to be key to the uh, firm strategy. But instead of allowing the key client program to dictate the individual goals, letting individual client teams identify those very specific goals for their team as they form. Some of the most successful plans we have seen actually map back to the individual key client team goals and map that back to either practice or office goals and even the higher firm strategic goals. So here's some typical responses we've heard during our interviews in regards to why people are forming client teams. One is that we want to increase revenue within a client. Two is we possibly want to expand into certain specific practices or geographic regions. The third is client retention. We want to strengthen and expand relationships. In fact, there's a, a few examples of robust key client team goals that were highlighted by a recent BTI consulting survey and worthy of mention here. 
as we mentioned, and they too, um, these aren't new programs, but firms are re-energizing these programs and using them as a tool to take very deep dives with their clients, really giving them the vehicle to help understand their needs and how firms can change slash improve to match these needs. Also, historically, some firms have used key client programs to help talk internally about succession plans. But it's interesting to note, research is now emerging, talking about how clients are looking to ensure succession plans are in place for them. And notably, from people are talking about the fact we don't get points for client service for answering their question about succession planning. We need to be out in front of those questions and working with our clients as far as how we can build succession plans together. Lastly, as you think about if you think about your clean client team program, don't forget to include the client. Someone once told me many years ago, client team programs are something you do with your client, not to your client. And as an added benefit, how many of us have been to GC panels where we've seen um, everyone talking about how firms just don't understand their business? Again, these programs are a vehicle to get you much closer and a much deeper understanding of their business. A true way to validate how well does the work that we do for the client align with their own strategic objectives? As marketing, business development, professional development uh, professionals on the phone here today, there's a few baseline things that we need to tackle in order to set this up for success. So we'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure and tools right here. Um, and really the, the first part on infrastructure for people that have been in successful is really setting the correct expectations within their own um, client team members. So starting out and being able to provide information about client to your consultants or attorney. So the ability to produce a client report that shows what's the financial information for them, what's happening within their industry, what's happening within their own uh, uh, PR and, and where they are in the news, and what type of relationships do we have uh, with the client? Secondly, looking at our own history with the client. So how, many, how much work have we done in the past? Can we ID any trends that we're seeing? What are our relationships? How many people do we have relationships over there and how strong are these relationships? More importantly is also looking at what work are we not getting? pausing and trying to figure out who's getting it, why are they getting it, which ties into looking at our successes and setbacks. One key aspect to, to all of this from uh, client retention is, is really baseline service surveys. So many firms in the very beginning will have a client interview and really try to establish uh, a baseline. And again, this is going to be helpful for looking to see how successful we've been as an individual client team. The third piece that we need to work on is helping our firm to identify a client to client team contact report. Who's talking to who, how are they talking, what are they talking about? To bring technology into the mix just for a second here, um, in surveying our clients that have been successful, and are using interaction to help them, they're really using uh, interaction for three different things. One is client team management. So things like the ability to link your account plan template into interaction, um, using reminders, identifying relationships would be the second. So the ability to see uh, within the client and within the firm where and who we have relationships with. And then obviously providing client reports. So we have out-of-box reports that you can use. Um, a lot of firms will take that and modify it to include and exclude data as needed. And then the third piece outside of relationships, identifying those, would be the metrics, the ability for interaction to capture all the different types of activities you have and to be able to report on some of these metrics. So the first part is looking at the infrastructure 
and the tools. And the second part is how do we start to really set up this client team program? So our belief in what we've seen be successful is the fact that you can start small. So as the next slide suggests, the small plus dense can equal power. The ability for you to start out small, adjust, analyze, and keep moving forward. So as we talk about how you move forward, we talk about how do you identify a small group of clients. Many firms will use segmentation to, for many different reasons. So they'll segment clients based on historical spend over the past several years. And that's great for a lot of different initiatives at the firm. But with the people we've talked to, it's not necessarily the best way to start a client team program. Starting out with your top 200 key clients is a big challenge. But if you have the ability to start small, the question then becomes, who do you start with? And so for the folks that have done it well, what they reported back to us is the fact that they've been able to start with clients that are served by a diverse mix of our own consultants and attorneys. Those that will have multiple people touching them, multiple people in different practices, multiple people in different offices. In addition to the fact that we have many people touching these clients, it's also important to look at clients that are in some type of transition within their own business or that their industry is in transition. These are folks that need your assistance and they just may not be raising their hand and asking the questions or knowing the questions to ask. So these are all good candidates in order to start out. We also talk to firms about how do you then start once you've identified clients, once you know the type of information you're gonna need, the type of infrastructure you might need uh, to start small. Um, how do we actually just get started? Um, and we've, we've talked a little bit about this before, but it's the, the notion that we need to baseline information for the team. So the introduction of the program, reviewing known client information, and reviewing communication plans. And then as a next step, working with your client team to define specific and measurable goals. And as I talked about earlier, the firms that seem to do it really well can then map those back to the larger um, either firm strategic goals or practice or office strategic goals. The firms, again, that we've talked to um, over the past several years, really think about kind of the operations aspect. We've talked about focus on what you already know. So that's the content, client information, and tools that you already have at your disposal. A little bit of focus on the operations. And then this notion of how do we analyze, adjust, repeat, and expand. So as we look at the analysis, as you set up your key client programs, need to build in the discipline and the expectations that we are going to analyze how we've done. So this is, has a couple of key components to it. One is interview client teams to get feedback. So you as marketing, business development, practice development professionals are going to talk to your own client team members, see how it's going for them. And then more importantly is probably talking to the client twice a year to say, how is this program? How are you benefiting from it? Um, is there anything we need to do uh, for adjust? Obviously, we're going to capture wins as we move forward. Um, and then the discipline internally to be ready to adjust. And this is probably the hardest part for a lot of our firms is um, adjusting on the fly. So this expectation needs to be set early on. And the last but not least is how do we get better? How do we get bigger? How do we get faster? And I think this is where technology can come to play, is that we've proven with a small group that we can um, build powerful client team programs. And now how can we automate this for efficiency? And this is where a lot of times people like myself, um, Michelle, Dave, will get pulled into conversations to say, how can we start to pull all the pieces together through integrations that have been built off the success we've had in the past. Next, who are our next 
handful of clients and we want to get into the client team program. So again, we're going to look at wins within what we've already done and try to build some type of ideal client profile that matches this program and the goals for the next wave of this program. And then third, a transition to suggest pursuit teams are very much the same as the client team. Just because they're not a client or haven't been a client for several years doesn't mean that there's not value in putting a pursuit team together. And we start with a lot of the same thoughts. Where do we have relationships? Which prospects are in a state of transition? And how can we help these folks? Client team programs are a big program, um, something we can't tackle in just 10 minutes. But as I mentioned early on, I, I, we hope that this is helpful in giving you a couple of good nuggets. And if you have questions, please, uh, please do use the uh, chat window. And with that, um, thank you for your time, and I pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you, Brian. Next up, we're going to have Dave Jacobs. And so I'll turn things over to Dave. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, my name is David Jacobs, and my topic today is on how our clients can build content and interaction with little to no manual effort. So just some quick background on me. I've been in the consult software consulting industry uh, for many years, uh, most of which have, have, have been spent at Interaction. Uh, during my eight plus years on the consulting team, I became very passionate uh, about understanding why our clients have challenges uh, with interaction user adoption, and, and, I want to, and I want to take a close look uh, at what possibly can be done to improve it. Um, so my passion extended actually to my educational pursuits, um, seven plus years into my doctoral studies uh, with my dissertation focused on understanding uh, the role that leadership behaviors and change management strategies play in interaction user adoption, and I should hopefully wrap that up this year. Additional background, I can tell you that I got really good client relationship training from my six years in the Marine Corps, lots of yes sirs and yes ma'ams that I have found to work really well in this industry. And certainly well, last but not least for me, uh, I adopted my best friend not too long ago from a high chill shelter uh, in Kentucky. So let's begin with the definition of the problem. Uh, we commonly hear our interaction clients cite two principal causes for why they're having challenges achieving their CRM or relationship uh, intelligence objectives. And I might add that these two causes are not mutually exclusive. So the first challenge is collecting the depth and breadth of contact that the end users, partners, consultants, lawyers require from interaction. And the second, is that user adoption among those end users is low or at least lower than what our clients would like it to be. So given this problem, um, an important question to ask is how can our clients build an effective passive content management strategy, which is the focus of this discussion. So when we talk about interaction adoption, uh, we really need to differentiate between uh, consumption and contribution of interaction content, and how to remedy the shortcomings in both. A lack of consumption could be the result of ill-defined use cases or business processes that use interaction as an enabler, or it could be the result of poor training or, in some cases, uh, an absence of training. Or it could be that the use case, the business process, and the tra training components uh, are solid, but the system lacks relevant and accurate content that the end users require. And so if the problem is the latter, then I hope that my presentation will provide at least a primer on the various tools available to you, our clients, to promote an effective passive data management strategy. So topics under the content umbrella include information harvested from emails, such as basic contact data plus relationships, the interaction synchronization of appointments from Outlook calendars, the setting of relationship strengths, and interaction integrations with third-party systems such as time and billing systems, Adderant Elite, HR systems such as PeopleSoft, and corporate demographic and supplemental 
key relationship providers such as BoardX, corporate affiliations, and CapIQ. So the interaction for Microsoft Outlook feature, commonly referred to as IMO, many of you have this feature deployed, is primarily a data consumption feature where users can readily see contacts, activities, and relationship information within their native Outlook. But one should also view it as a low effort contribution tool where with one or two clicks of a button, an activity can be logged from an email or a new contact can be added directly to the interaction firm list. So a common challenge that we hear from our clients is a lack of business contact sharing or what is also referred to as end users promoting their contacts. Partner or consultant John or Jane Doe either perhaps doesn't have the time to promote contacts or is not inclined to share their business contacts with whom they feel they have a proprietary relationship. So one way to address this challenge is to implement an interaction out of the box feature called Smart Connect, which compares an end user's unresolved contacts, those that have not been designated private, personal, or business, with important contact types such as clients, prospects, and alumni. And so if Smart Connect, as it reviews those user contacts, finds a match, it can either auto-promote that contact or make a recommendation to the user to promote the contact. And I can tell you during my time on the services team, like four or five years ago, most of our clients were only comfortable making recommendations for promotion. But we've seen a trend of late where our firms are more comfortable now auto-promoting contacts that match up with key firm contacts. Because those contacts that they own or have are considered the possession or belong to the firm. Interaction Outlook appointment synchronization feature automatically syncs appointments with predefined key contacts and those appointments then turn into interaction activities once the appointment passes in time. And this is certainly helpful to business development efforts because a commonly asked question that we hear is how did prospect XYZ become a client or what specific steps do we take to facilitate our expanding their legal spend with another one of our practice groups? So syncing those appointments can build that business development history that you can hopefully replicate with other clients or prospects. And as you can see here in the screen capture, the checkbox default can be unchecked by the end user if desired. Interaction mobility is very similar to IMO and it's designed primarily as a content consumption tool. Although as with IMO, mobility is also a low effort contribution tool where contacts and activities can be easily added to the interaction firm list. This year we're excited to announce that a new business card scanning feature. In the past, a consultant, a lawyer, or a partner would collect business cards from, say, a business development luncheon and hand them to his or her secretary for annual manual entry and interaction upon the return. So now those cards can be quickly scanned from their mobile device during the cab ride back from that luncheon or by the secretary. And we have found that this feature also comes in handy at events where large numbers of business cards are collected. So as relationships are the lifeblood of a professional services organization, we have found that it's important to supplement those relationships that are set subjectively with those that are set objectively. So as you can see in the top graphic, this is a traditional synchronization of contacts from a user's outlook to the user contacts to the firm list. And the end result of that process is that the, con the connection creates a nose relationship based upon the user's decision to promote that contact. The user then has the additional option to go to that relationship, that knows relationship, and identify that he or she has a strong relationship with that particular client or prospect. And so now firms are supplementing that subjectively set relationship with objectively set relationships via the interaction IQ module, which mines email traffic looking at response times, 
to identify via our, via our algorithm a relationship strength score between one and five, as you can see here with the cellular bar graphic. And these scores then cascade throughout the interaction interfaces as they can be seen in interaction from Microsoft Outlook, Mobility, the Windows client, and the web client for reporting. A hands-free content or data quality play now is our new signature line capture feature, which comes out this month and is a bolt-on to our existing IQ product. So this feature can scan an incoming email signature line, which in theory has the most up-to-date job title, company name, and phone number information. And it can process it either as a new contact, if it doesn't already exist in interaction, or if the contact does exist, the feature can be configured to either automatically overwrite that existing contact information or funnel the change through normal data change management process for a data steward to decide the updates. So whether it's reviewed first by a data steward or configured to update the existing match contact record, that update is then pushed out to everyone who has that contact on their user contact list. Interaction applications are a proprietary integration tool that we use to link up third-party systems with interaction. And we commonly link up third-party systems, such as the time and billing, adder and delete, an HR system, such as PeopleSoft, as well as third-party content providers, CapIQ, corporate affiliations. So why is this important? Why do our clients build, say, first the client integration? So our clients commonly load client practice group, billing responsible lawyer information, as well as financial information. And this lawyer and practice group information specifically supplements the existing subjective and objective relationship information for account management and cross-selling purposes. That financial information which comes in typically is not exposed to all end users by our clients for obvious reasons. But in the case of our Canadian clients, it can certainly help with the Canadian anti-spam legislation implied consent part of the statute, which is commonly defined as any client who has a greater than zero two-year rolling billing number. And if that is greater than zero, it's okay to contact that, that client or prospect. As far as an HR integration is concerned, our clients receive the benefits uh, from having accurate alumni information, and they know in real time whether an employee becomes an alumni and vice versa. In terms of a third-party content provider, such as CapIQ, corporate affiliations, or BoardX, that corporate demographic data, specifically industry, NIC codes, SIC codes, can help with setting up indus internal industry groups and assist marketing with tailoring events and mailings to those client or prospects in a particular industry or sector. And including board members in the third party feed provides another bridge to new business by seeding your system with important contacts that your lawyers, consultants, and partners can then identify that they know as well as leverage for cross selling activities. So let's now review a real world example that combines the power of a client integration with an out of the box interaction automated tool called Folder Dependency Analyzer, also known as FDA. So in this use case, we had a client who was interested in categorizing their clients into four revenue tiers uh, to guide their client teams in general account management and relationship building activities. So they brought in financials from their time and billing system into interaction, but they did not expose them to the end users, and instead, they used those financials behind the scenes in their tier calculations. So for example, tier ones were clients who produced over two million in revenue over a one year rolling period. And those tier calculations were then set up as save searches in the Windows client that FDA would then trigger nightly to add clients to and remove clients from tier one through tier four contact types based upon those predefined tier definitions. So once that integration and FDA processes are set up, they run nightly as a scheduled interaction job without manual intervention. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Dave. If you have any questions uh, for Dave, 
Uh, again, please submit those via the questions pane. Next up, we have Michelle Woodyear. Michelle. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. And I realize I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to be succinct and on point. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I started my career on the IT side, and I worked at Fortune 100 companies such as PPG, MCI, and Conifer Phillips in a variety of different sort of roles, from finance to procurement, and then sort of moved into marketing, um, where I found my really found my passion, and I've been in ever since. In that role, I was um, trained as a Six Sigma black belt. I'm I'm all about data. I love to use data um, to make decisions. And if I had to describe my best talent, I think it's that I'm a problem solver. I like to listen to business problems and find innovative solutions. Often I like to use technology to solve those problems, but sometimes it just requires fixing processes. Um, I'm almost as passionate about digital marketing as I am about cycling. I'm a big hill climber. So I really believe in the promise that digital marketing has for law firms. And I hope I share that enthusiasm with you and give you some insight in how you can piece it all together and make it work at your firm. So all of you have heard about digital marketing. Um, many of you have experienced facets, facets of it as you visit websites out in the world, such as personalization. Um, you may go to Amazon and you look at a pair of brown shoes and it says, oh, you might also like these brown shoes. So marketing has really forever been changed by this technology. Um, the use of the internet and also social media. But how does this, what's in this for law firms or professional service organizations? We're not selling products, we're selling services. So how do we transition that, uh, that digital marketing experience to make sense at your firm? For that reason, professional services firms have been a bit slower to adapt to the changes in digital marketing. And many firms will now need to invest significantly in infrastructure and human resources to deploy a successful inbound marketing strategy. So technologists and marketers, they understand the need for digital marketing programs. But how do you communicate that to your firm? Um, I recommend talking to key decision makers and interviewing them to uncover their particular value proposition. Ask them questions to uncover um, their, where thing, what things are most important to them. How do they use CRM and do they see it important for the firm? Why is it important to their practice group or their business unit? Um, why is it important to them? A lot of them, some of them will have great ideas and understand that CRM is sort of a foundational system, but others, it's, this interview session sort of turns into an education session. So you may need to start to teach them about how to shift away from this sort of spray and pray marketing um, to real-time targeting strategies and then how they can use the CRM to facilitate that. Um, I've had conversations with people like, let's just send it out to everyone we know. And I said, well, you can certainly do that, but then that dilutes your message because then they realize you're not sending them stuff that's pertinent to them, and then they stop listening. It's sort of like you know Charlie Brown's mother in their ear at some point. So I want you to show them how you can integrate your CRM system with your website and get a wealth of prospecting information. That's really showing them the value for them. Brian talked a little bit about turning um, um, client teams into pursuit teams, and pursuit teams will need this prospecting information. You'll need to introduce them to ERM and the power of understanding client relationships firm-wide. Where do we have good client relationships? Where can we make them better? Where are we struggling? And then the, finally, the hardest and most important task, I think, is to convince them that potential clients are checking them out on the web, and they're looking at what they're saying and what they're reading. And the best way to stay top of mind is to create the content um, that will help them generate business. So let's talk a little bit about what is involved in a digital marketing system. What does it include? Of course, all of you have a corporate website. If you don't, um, then we should go back to a different conversation. But a lot of you are probably using them as an online brochure. So you're missing this opportunity to provide rich content that engages your clients. Um, and firms, I think, struggle with how to create this content that engages their clients because they don't know who's visiting their website, they don't know what they're reading, um, they, their content is stale or uninspiring, it's old and it doesn't resonate with clients. So firms just don't know how to take their brochure and turn it into a richer experience for clients. 
um, firms I've seen and I've talked to have started on this journey. A lot of them are starting to blog or they're interacting on and sharing um, content on social media, maybe on LinkedIn. Some are even sharing it on Facebook or Twitter. But a lot of them haven't really sort of put together an integrated plan or strategy. They're sort of dabbling around and trying to see what works and what doesn't by trial and error. So as a, as a client advisor, I've had the opportunity to work with many firms and help them refine their strategy. It's not something that you can roll out in a few weeks or months. Most firms need to create a multi-year strategy. A lot of, some of it involves technology, but some of it involves process change. Some of it involves writing new content and getting lawyers to understand the value of their content. A great deal of time will be spent on organizational change and developing a sharing culture. Um, you have to invent in the right tools. You'll see some of them listed here. Um, you have to make sure it's easy for lawyers to participate. You have to include mobile tools, business card readers, and email scrapers to harvest contacts. Dave talk, just talked to you about those sort of tools that make passive data management that's sort of like pressing the easy button for keeping their context in the system updated. You have to focus on creating good content. Content you can share via social media, through webinars like you're at today, and broadcast email. You also have to make sure if your um, professional service um, descriptions or bios are updated regularly, they're fresh, um, that they're on point, and they're engaging and sharing your brand with your clients in the way that you want to be viewed. And then finally, how do, you, how do you actually implement this? And I think Brian talked a lot about starting small. And I'm going to recommend the same exact thing, start small. There is no such thing as a firm-wide initiative. You have to find a project champion or an influencer, someone who sees the value of CRM, who is respected by other partners and practice group leaders or business unit leaders, and then ask them to pilot a system. Put all of your energy into making them successful. Capture every positive story you can publicize and market it. Write articles for the firm newsletter or practice group newsletters or business unit newsletters. Get on their management meeting agendas. Market and sell this new strategy um, that you're trying to implement at your firm. So I'm just going to take a quick look at all the components that would go into digital strategy. Um, you know, this is a short presentation, and some of you um, are going to need to dive deeper in this, but this will give you an idea of the components that you'll need and where to sort of start. So most firms, I don't know how many of you out there in this boat, have kind of ignored their CRM systems for the last, you know, couple of decades. Um, just the mention of CRM to a room full of um, professionals or lawyers might elicit some even groans or complaints about incomplete or inconsistent data, or they just don't know how to use the system. So. Um, add to that their reluctance to share their carefully cultivated contact lists with the firm. And you may think that this, you'll never get the CRM system um, off the ground. It might be impossible for you. However, using some of the tools we talked about earlier um, to get that data in shape um, really will propel your, um, your initiative forward. Um, you have to have a robust CRM system. It's an integral part of today's digital marketing platform. You can't do broadcast email or inbound marketing or prospecting if you don't have a functional CRM system. So how do you make it work at your firm? You just have to find those tools to make it easy and seamless for everyone to participate. Again, those tools are email scrapers, mobile apps, um, you know, using IMO right where they work, putting um, the CRM system right in Outlook where they spend their entire day. The next part is once you get your contact management system short up, is Start on your content strategy and your nurturing program. Um, you have to have something to give your client. Um, today, um, every firm, I don't care what business you're in, they're giving out free information. If, you, if you're a pool company um, and you're selling pools, you'll put out guides on how to keep your pool clean, how to maintain your pump. That's what consumers expect, and they, it applies not just for um, product-based businesses, but for services. So they're looking for good content. And if you have good content, the best way to share that content is to integrate your content management system or your website with your CRM system. And that way you can refine your thought leadership and create compelling content that resonates with your clients. So if your CMS is talking to your CRM system and you know what clients are reading and you know what content is compelling, you can stop wasting attorneys and professionals' time. Why are they spending time writing white papers that have had one view? 
when this sort of content it resonates with clients. So you can hone your, um, you can use your website analytics to hone your message and really make sure that the content resonates with clients. You can get rid of all the noise. You might have 40,000 pages on your website, but only 10, you know, uh, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 of them are being read. You need to really understand that. So you have to use your tools to develop these client nurturing programs. Um, as you as you start to see what clients are looking at, you may start to notice that um, maybe you have a client success team and you're looking at these top 30 clients and you're really interested about what they're looking at on your site. You can use um, the analytics from your site, integrate it with your CRM system to tell you, oh, they're, they're a client of our employment law practice group, but they're looking at all of this patent information. Maybe they have a need in the patent area. Maybe I need to have a conversation with them and connect them with some attorneys in our patent practice group. And that really teaches your clients that you know about them. Of course, you have to do this subtly. Um, I mean, everyone understands they're being watched when they look at your site, but you want to do things like this subtly. So um, you can start to put together plans and how you can introduce them to other practice groups and other service areas and really demonstrate to the client that you understand them, their industry, and their needs. And finally, the whole purpose of all of this, of course, is to get business, develop these opportunities. Um, you know, Brian talked about creating pursuit teams. All of this information is the food for those pursuit teams. Um, you want to develop these opportunities with clients that are engaged with you. You want to identify opportunities where you can cross-serve them. Um, and all of this can do be done through your analytics. You want to communicate and track these opportunities regularly at um, practice group meetings, business unit meetings, or client team meetings. And you want to make sure you use interactive dashboards to do that. Um, we, we have, we're uh, currently looking at a product, the business development module, that brings all these dashboards and all this information into easy to use interface. Um, so, in summing this all up for you, you need to take your time, you need to step back, you need to talk to the influencers and rainmakers at your firm. You need to craft a strategy. It's going to be multi-year. You can't do all of this at once. Start, start with your um, contacts, move on to content. And then you can move into nurturing programs and then finally opportunities and pursuits. Make sure you're measuring all through the process that you're, you know, you have, you're taking baselines and measuring your improvement. Make sure you get buy-in from upper management. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them what the benefits could be, what the value proposition is. Have your rainmakers um, participate. Ask them what their pain points are. And listen, listen, listen. I, when I worked in-house, I talked to many of our rainmakers, and they have, they're good, naturally good at what they do. That's why they're rainmakers. But they have so many ideas about how you can solve their business development problems and help them do it better. So don't go to a meeting and tell them how you're going to do this for them. Listen to them. Don't um, take tons of notes. Research it and come back with a really thoughtful way for them to share um, to share their, their um, ideas and content out to their audience. Refine your approach. Tie your strategy to the goals of the firm. Make sure that if there's a goal in your firm to increase business development hours, that you're providing the infrastructure to pull out those reports or to um, give them ideas of what types of things they can do. And clearly communicate your value proposition. Again, market your system. Create a case for sharing contacts firm-wide. Um, I had this when I worked in-house again. I did had a lot of objections about sharing contacts firm-wide. And what I asked them to do, to do was look at our top 30 clients and see how many lawyers they were connected. So we created sort of this heat map that showed that really everyone knows these contacts. So the case for not sharing was sort of just completely eroded and blown out of the water. Everyone from every practice group across the firm knew the same contacts. So the key is other firms are doing this. They're moving in that direction. Um, everyone is starting to catch up in the legal and professional service industry into the digital marketing that has been around for years in other industries. And if you don't start now, you're going to be behind and at a disadvantage because um, your clients are going to grow to expect good content and um, timely information from you. So hopefully that's a little bit of a you know 30,000 foot view of how to get started on creating a digital marketing strategy for your firm. Happy to talk more with you one-on-one -on -one or share ideas. That's why we're here as client advisors. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks again to uh, Dave and to Brian for the great information that they provided. Um,
at this point, that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. And so, again, if you have questions for any of the three client advisors now, uh, please feel free to ask them via the questions pane in your webinar control panel. Um, we have had questions come in, so let's take a look. First question we had is, uh, we are looking to deploy IMO as well as reintroduce interaction. Would a client advisor be able to help us begin the process, which would include how to best identify and communicate to the firm our goals? Um, I'm going to take that one myself. I don't know that we need to throw that out to the team, but absolutely yes. Uh, that's exactly why we put this team to pro, uh, this program in place. And um, already, those are the types of things uh, that I've seen each of the client advisors help uh, our clients with. So uh, absolutely yes to that. The next question is, I think it looks like this one would be best for Dave. Could you elaborate on how to integrate something like Cap IQ with interaction? Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's a really good question. Uh, we've integrated, I don't know necessarily whether Cap IQ, but we've done Vortex integrations, corporate affiliations integrations, and they're all pretty much the same. Uh, once we either match our client's existing client base with that source provider's uh, scope of coverage, we can, once that matching exercise is done, we can load those clients directly into, into your interaction system. They then have the uh, ID for CAP IQ, and then the ID then facilitates the ongoing flow of data for the in-scope uh, companies. So for other firms who have a specific group of companies that they want to uh, capture data for, such as the Fortune 1000, uh, many of these providers do have uh, the list that then can seed your system, and then you can then do merge those uh, Fortune 1000 client companies with your own. And then, of course, via that ID on that company record from uh, the provider of that data, you can then facilitate the exchange of data going forward, or the uh, uh, the content from that provider going forward. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, here's one, uh, this would be for Michelle. Uh, can you provide an example of how you would personalize content on a firm website? Thanks, Matt. Well, that's a great question. Um, so when you know, when your website is integrated with your CRM system and people come to visit your home page, um, and you know that maybe they're, they're a client of a certain business um, unit or practice group, you can tailor the content they see on that home page. Maybe you had a new attorney or professional join that group and you want to introduce them to them. You can, you can totally put that on the sidebar so they can see it. Maybe there's a new piece of thought leadership that that group has published and, you can, and that can appear on the home page. And as that person navigates through the site and you learn more about them, you can go, dive even deeper into it. You can start to realize that they're looking at certain types of content and say, you know, say oh, you've been reading these thought leadership articles. Maybe you would also like to leave these. And so what it does is it doesn't make them have to search through your website or, or drill down through a lot of things. You're actually sort of anticipating what they'll want to read next or what they want to do next. And you can bring your blog content, your white papers, your webinars um, to them. And give instead of giving them a list of thousands of articles that you may have, you're giving them five or six that will resonate with them. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Got a question that came up, uh, Dave, while you were talking. This is a follow-up uh, to the Cap IQ question, uh, and the question is: Is Cap IQ the only market data service provider that you are able to integrate with Interaction? No, I mean we we can really integrate with any provider as long as they can provide the data, say in the proper uh, staging table or SQL table, or some firms provide the data on an FTP site that we then pull in. Uh, it's just a matter of understanding the source data and then our historically consulting team building the proper integration to bring that data in on a monthly or quarterly feed, however it's set up. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And uh, I can certainly echo that. I've worked with clients who've uh, done integrations with various sources. And again, they've either uh, done it themselves or used our professional service consulting team to do that work. What we have next for questions. Um, I'm going to 
edit a little bit of this one, but the, Brian, this one will be for you. The, the um, basically what they're saying is that that they've got more of a um, an industry group focus and asking if the um, best practices that you talked about for client teams would be uh, relevant for industry teams as well. Yeah, ab absolutely, Matt. Um, I think the principles of um, what we talked about for client teams would completely apply if the focus was on an industry team. Um, and I've seen the same thing with, with other clients that are looking to grow geographically. Um, so it really starts with maybe a more of a firm strategy conversation. And if it's around this particular industry or if it's around growth in this certain area, we can apply those same principles um, that we talked about for a client team uh, into the individual industry team. Um, where I've seen slight differences is with the industry team, uh, you, you may have multiple specific measurable goals um, that can happen. Um, so it might be a little bit broader of a, a goal setting process for you, but um, Definitely, I think the, the principles um, of what we talked about apply to geographic or industry sectors. Thanks, Brian. Uh, this is a question for Michelle. Uh, related to integrating CMS um, with CRM, how have you seen this accomplished in the past? Uh, what information have you seen written back from the, CIA, uh, from the content management system to the CRM? So we're working with clients right now who are doing this. Um, and it's very interesting. Many of them have different approaches, and you have to really start with defining your requirements. Will you be focusing, um, you know, are you wanting to use it as a prospecting system? Are you wanting to use it to hone your thought leadership? Where do you want to start? Um, I think that the ones we're working with have very robust CMS systems um, that have excellent analytic systems, so really, what the integration is, is is being able to tell the who. How many times have you asked, you know, you've sent out reports that said your your practice group page, your business unit page has been built, viewed 5,000 times, your bio has been viewed 10,000 times, and the question you always get back is who. That's a very hard question to answer unless you've integrated your CMS and your CRM system. So defining what, what questions you're answering will define what information you'll write back and forth um, between the two systems. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, here's one for Dave. Other than setting client tiers based on financials, what other uh, uses have you seen for uh, FDA, so the folder dependency in it? Yeah, really good question. Uh, we've seen FDA used effectively uh, in collaboration with an HR integration. So if you're bringing in uh, employees and they should happen to change to an alumni status that updates an additional field in our action and then FDA picks up that change and automatically moves that contact from the employee folder or firm personnel to alumni. Uh, we've also seen FDA used effectively for CAFL compliance where we our clients set up uh, anti folders and subscription folders and move contacts in and out of folders as well as into send no marketing communications based upon an e-marketing system such as future or concept automatically populating those fields and then FDA moving the contacts. Thanks Dave. Um, this question, I think I'll take this one, so they're asking about um, if we still offer the uh, KSI audit, and does this program replace that? Um, we, this is the keys for some folks uh, on the call may have participated in our key success indicator uh, audit where we go out and um, we've created a methodology where we ask you a series of questions in 14 different categories uh, to help you quantify to what extent uh, the things you're doing around CRM marketing and business development correlate with known best practices. and give you a report that lets you benchmark against a best practice target score uh, as well as the average scores of other firms who participated in the audit to do some peer benchmarking. 
uh, that program still exists. That's now part of the client success team program. So uh, in addition to uh, getting an account manager and a client advisor, uh, by being a client of Interaction, you also have access to uh, getting a free KSI audit done. And if that's something that you're interested in, you can contact either your account manager or your client advisor. Perusing other questions, these are quite a few are fairly specific to them. So we will do some follow-up with those. I'm not sure those are going to be relevant for the whole um, audience. Or they're long. <laughs> so um, what I'll do is, um, as a reminder, you will all receive an email with a link to the recording. Um, so I think this is probably a good place to, uh, to end the webinar today. Very much appreciate everybody's time. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed getting a chance to learn a little bit more about the client advisors. Um, from my own experience, I've learned a lot over the past several months. Uh, just having conversations with the team. Uh, they all bring uh, unique skills and experiences. It's helped me all, out a lot. It's helped, um, I think, focus my own uh, thoughts and understanding on what helps clients be successful with their marketing and business development efforts. So I would strongly uh, encourage you to take the opportunities to have conversations uh, with the client advisors. Uh, I think you'll find it worth your time and they're just really good sounding boards to bounce ideas off of to brainstorm. Uh, so please take advantage of that. So with that, we'll conclude the webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for your time and have a great day.